My brothers and sisters in Christ, by the grace of God, we have published four volumes in the book of the Revelation from the phenomenal work of Father Athanasios Mytilineos on this topic. We are hoping to finish the final and fifth volume by year 2020, and until then we will record a few excerpts from some of the final chapters. In homily 95, Father Mytilineos explains that the heart of all Christian struggle the goal, if you will, is to see the face of God, and more specifically, the glorified face of Jesus Christ. This is what St. John the Theologian says in chapter 22, beginning of verse 4. The servants of God and the Lamb shall see his face. And I translate from Father Athanasius. Here, my friends, we find ourselves in the heart of the heart of the entire book of Revelation and of the entire Holy Scripture. We are at the heart of all the Christian struggle, faith, hope, and love. Everything is here. It is the hidden, hoped-for, desirable, and eagerly expected eternal vision of the face of God. Ultimately, this is the goal behind all our spiritual struggles to be deemed worthy to behold the face of God. This is the ultimate purpose of Christianity, and it requires our highest concentration and effort. Now you may ask, is this all? Nothing more? Of course, there's much more we can say about the topic, and we will do that. But for now, I will try to help you with a vivid example, and please forgive me if you find it too simplistic. For two people who are very much in love, what would be considered to be of ultimate value? A work robe, a beautiful dress, a house, an automobile, thousands of dollars, gold coins? I don't think so. The most desirable thing would be for the two people in love to be in close proximity and look at each other in the face. Likewise, the greatest blessedness for us would be to see the face of God, the face of our beloved, glorified Jesus Christ. This is the greatest blessedness. This is incomparable to anything else, immeasurable. I use this example so you can gain some understanding of what it means to see the face of God. And we will be seeing it insatiably, to use a phrase of Simeon, the new theologian. He uses the phrase insatiable cessation. We will be satiated, but we will never say we had enough of this. Boredom is something of this life. Boredom is impossible in the kingdom of God. God is infinite, and the vision of his face is also infinite. St. John the Evangelist articulates and expresses this reality with such simplicity and assurance, and they shall see his face. St. Andrew of Caesarea writes, and they will see him face to face, not in riddles, but as he was seen by the holy apostles on the holy mountain, meaning Mount Tabor, as the great Dionysius the Areopagite said. Now, what proves that all these things are not riddles or imaginings? The historical fact of the transfiguration of Christ, witnessed and physically seen by the three disciples, Peter, James, and John. One may rightfully ask, how can men, a mere creature, come to see the invisible and infinite God? St. Cyril of Jerusalem answers in his 10th Catechism, paragraph 7. For this reason, since no one alive could see the face of divinity, he assumed the face of humanity so he could see it and live. What a beautiful expression. He assumed human nature, a human face, so we can see him and live. Again, you may ask, what sort of nourishment will be provided in the kingdom of God? What would be our sustenance? Our nourishment and our immortality will be the vision of the face of God. And we continue with St. Cyril of Jerusalem. And yet, when he wished to show 
even that with a little majesty, when his face did shine as the sun, the disciples fell down affrighted. If then his bodily countenance shining not in their full power, but according to the capacity of the disciples affrighted them, so that even thus they could not bear it, how could any man gaze upon the majesty of the Godhead? St. Cyril, Catechism 10, paragraph 7. The scripture in its entirety reveals that man would truly see the face of God. Everything points to the fact that men would see the face of God in this life and forever in the one to come as a face of men. What else could Prophet Baruch mean when he says, This is our God. He hath found out all the way of knowledge and hath given it unto Jacob his servant and to Israel his beloved. Afterward, he shewed himself upon earth and conversed with men. Baruch 4, verse 37. Isn't this clear? That we would see God with a human face? When Simeon the God-bearer says, Now let thy servant depart in peace, for mine eyes have seen your salvation, my eyes have seen the Savior, who is the light of the nations. I saw the face of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This is why Clement of Alexandria writes in his Pedagogos, The face of God is known and illumined through the Logos, through the Word, who incarnated. The face of the Father is the Son, who became flesh with five senses. This is why when his disciple Philip asked, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us, John 14, 8, the Lord answered, don't you know me, Philip? I have been with you all this time. He who has seen me, he has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? We are of one essence. Thus the face of the Father is the face of the incarnate Son. St. Andrew is very clear when he refers to St. Dionysius the Areopagite, stating that we will see God in the face of Christ. We will see him face to face as the disciples saw him on Mount Tabor. The only difference will be that on Mount Tabor, the disciples saw him as much as they could because human nature was not yet renewed to be able to see his full glory. In the future age, however, after our renewal, we will be able to see what we now cannot see or even imagine we will certainly see the face of the glorified Jesus Christ. The contemporaries of Christ receive but a small taste of this. And let's not think that the glorified face of Christ was only seen by three disciples. This exclusivity would be suspect and somewhat strange to an outsider. St. Paul says, Did I not see the Lord Jesus? As he says, he saw him on the road to Damascus as bright as the sun. He saw him, much like the three disciples on Mount Tabor, who fell down from fear, but they were not blinded because their hearts were pure. Saul, however, fell down full of fear, but he was blinded because he was persecuting Christ at the time. And God knows how many other such revelations St. Paul had of Jesus Christ. He emphatically says that he received the gospel directly from Christ, so he's not a second-rate apostle. Additionally, so many saints shared in the divine glory and shone like the glory of transfigured Christ on Tabor. These are historical proofs, my friends. Thus, St. John the Evangelist clearly says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not been revealed what we shall be. But we know when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We shall be like him. We will also be glorified, and that's why we will be able to see him as he is. This is inconceivable. We will see the face of God, which according to St. Anthemus of Jerusalem, is the light and his majesty and glory, as seen by the apostles on Mount Tabor. This is the face of God, the vision of his glory, 
since no one can see the essence of God. As you know, people in the Old Testament could only see the glory of God. God, however, assumed our human nature, defied it at the very conception, and in the New Testament, we can see his glorified face. In the kingdom of God, we will behold and see the face of Christ in inconceivable glory. Unlike in the era of the New Testament, the vision of the face of God in the Old Testament did not assure one's well-being. When Moses requested to see God's face, the answer was, No man shall see me and live, Exodus 33.20. Today, however, because of the Incarnation, we need to see the face of God to live eternally. If we only knew the significance of Incarnation, this is exactly what Moses saw in the Old Testament. When God says to Moses, uh, Stay behind the rock, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Exodus chapter 33, verse 20. St. Gregory the Theologian, in his second theological homily, comments about his experiential knowledge as a divine sufferer, much like Moses. Paschotathia in Greek, Suffering the divine is an expression about those who are immersed in the uncreated light. St. Gregory writes, What is this that I have suffered, my friends and mystics and lovers of the divine? I was running up to the mountain to get a hold of God. So I climbed the mountain and I went through the cloud. And then I turned within myself and when I looked, I barely saw the back of God, because he was covered by the rock, the word of God who incarnated for us. So the rock that hides divinity is the flesh of God, the flesh or the human nature of Christ. And I continue with St. Gregory. And as I attempted to see for a little while, I could not see the first pure essence of God, which is only known to the Trinity and is hidden even to the cherubim. But I saw the last or outer essence of God, the divine glory, which one sees by beholding God's majestic works. We, we read in the Psalms, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork, Psalm 19.1. What St. Gregory the theologian saw was the glory of God, and St. Gregory Palamas will articulate on this centuries later. He will tell us that God communes with creation through his energies, because the essence of God is unparticipable to all creation. The energy of God divides indivisibly and accordingly based on the being and state of creation. Inanimate creation communes with the existential energy of God, plants and animals with the vivifying energy of God, and noetic beings with the sanctifying or deifying energy of God. So according to St. Gregor the Theologian, the back of God are the attributes of God which are reflected in his creation, where we see the power, the wisdom, and the love of God. The divine glory begins with these and progresses until one sees the uncreated light of God. All these descriptions of St. Gregory are included in the for now we see dimly as in a mirror of saint paul in the kingdom of god we will see god directly face to face moses the god seer and even elijah saw god dimly as in a mirror for we know in part and we prophesy in part but when that which is perfect has come then that which is in part will be done away first corinthians 13 verses 9 till 12. In this world, we are spiritual infants. There, in the kingdom of God, we will mature. We will be perfected to the measure of the stature of Christ. There, we will see the fullness of Christ in his glory, and we will know God the way he knows us. Naturally, we will not know his first or innermost essence, but the outer, the effulgence of his essence which is the divine glory 
and we will do all this in the person and face of Jesus Christ.